Okay, welcome to this video in which I try to explain why tau shows up when we're computing convolutions. Uh, this is one of those things that I found in teaching this material as well as learning it myself those many years ago to be really confusing. So hopefully by the time we're done with this video um, it will make some sense as to why a tau shows up when you're trying to actually compute convolutions. The first thing we need to talk about, this is the standard notation for um, convolution, at least standard in uh, engineering. Mathematicians look upon this thing as abhorrent. It's um, really very misleading uh, notation. It makes you think that I'm going to get y of t, maybe for a particular value of t, by looking at x at that same value of t and h at that same value of t. And it turns out that nothing could be further from the truth. Um, basically, what we have to do in order to get y of t for a particular value of t, in principle, we need to look at the whole time waveform x and the whole time waveform h. There may be special cases where we don't have to do that, but in general, we have to look at the whole waveforms. So that's where the t comes in. The way we actually compute y of t is as this convolution integral. x of tau times h of t minus tau. And this is where the tau comes in, that mysterious and strange Greek letter. Um, basically, what this is telling us is tau is going to go from minus infinity to infinity. And this tau is the vehicle by which the entire part or the entire x, not just x at a particular time, and the entire h, not just h at a particular time, comes into play in finding y of t. So let's try to, um, to uh, uh, talk about this in a little bit to try to show you how it makes sense to introduce the tau that we do. So let's begin by find, or looking at x of t. Okay, x of t is a time signal uh, by convention. Uh, when we're talking about finding the output of a uh, system, x of t is usually the input. And so let's just draw an arbitrary x of t. I'll draw a complex exponential because it's sort of easy to draw. Okay, so x is actually a function in the sense that if I have a particular value of t, say 2 here, I can go up to the line x of t, and at this value x of 2, I find out that this has a particular value, say, I'm just making up a number here, 0.25. Okay. If x is really a, <clears throat> a decaying exponential, that doesn't seem very likely, but I just made up a number. So x is a function, and it takes an input value or an argument and gives you a particular value. Now, we tend to think of x as a time function. That is, as something that changes over time, and we think of t as representing time. But there's nothing special about t. So we could, if we wanted to, and I know you probably don't, but we have to do it anyway, instead of talking about x of t, we can talk about x of tau. Okay, x is still a function. Now when tau is equal to 2, x of tau is going to be 0.25. Again, x is just a function. Okay. And it's our interpretation of x as a time function and something that uh, unfolds as time progresses that makes us a little hard to conceive of. But mathematically, all we're doing is changing the argument of our function x to, um, uh, to changing it from t to tau. And similarly, with h of tau. Okay, so again, if it makes you feel better, I can start off drawing a function which I'll call h of t, where this again is a function of t. 
But again, this is just a function. It takes some arbitrary value of t, uh, well, let's say 3 in this case. I go up and find the value of h at 3, which in this case would be 1. Okay. So again, because it's a function, I can replace t by tau. Okay. Or I can get even crazier. What I really need to do for um, convolution is instead of having h of tau, I need to have h of t minus tau. Okay. So how do we interpret that? Well, let's try to graph it. Again, we'll think of this as a function of tau, h of t minus tau. Again, when we go back to our definition of y, we want to compute the output, we want to compute the y value for a specific value of t. And that specific value of t is what shows up here. So suppose we want to find h of t minus tau when t is equal to 2. Okay, just as, a, as an example, I've picked that arbitrarily. Well, I know that h of tau looks like this thing that I've drawn in blue. It turns out that h of t minus tau I get by reflecting this thing I've drawn in blue around the tau is equal to zero line. So when I do that reflection, I get this thing here that I'm drawing in purple here. We'll draw it in sort of a lightish pinkish purple so it's easier to see. And then I shift it so that the point that was at zero now lines up with two. Okay. So when I'm done, I've got something that looks like this. Or if I draw it on the, on the unspoiled uh, picture, I've got something that looks like this. Now, if you don't believe me, if you still find this really hard to visualize, think of h of 2 minus tau. And think of values of tau. Okay, you can actually make a little table here. So when tau is 0, h of 2 minus tau, 2 minus tau is 2. h of 2, when I go back here, is this value. And so I would get this, or I'm sorry, I'd get 2 when tau is 0. When tau is 1, h of 2 minus 1 is going to be 1. I mean, that's h of 1 over here. And I get this value. So again, if, you, if this really doesn't make sense, what you can do is for a particular value of t, go and take different values of tau, come back to our original picture of tau, h of tau, and uh, find the h of different values of its argument and see what they look like. And you'll see that I haven't lied to you here. So again, conceptually, what we've done is we've taken h we've reflected it or flipped it um, around the line tau is equal to zero and then shifted it to the right by t. Okay, so what I have now is I have um, I have this x of tau which I've graphed here as a function of tau. I've got h of t minus tau which again depends on a particular value of t, but we think of it as a function of tau. And I can take these two guys and multiply them because that's what I have to do up here. So let's clear away a space to do that in. And again, I'm going to draw these as functions of tau. So h of t minus tau looks like what I have in light blue. It looks like this. It goes out to this value of t. But again, this is a function of, of tau. So this is h of t minus tau. x of tau looked something like this. And it was 0 out here. So this is x of tau. 
Now what this integral is telling me to do is to find the area under the product. Well, the product of these two guys is going to look something like this. And the area under that product is just the area that I've got there. And so I've work, I work out the, um, the integral, and that gives me y of t for this particular value of t. Okay, For a different value of t, suppose I want to get y of, well, I'll call it t prime, but now I want to get y of t for a different value of t. Well, my h of t minus tau has changed. Now h of t minus tau looks like this. Now this would actually be h of t prime minus tau. And the product of h of tau and, I'm sorry, x of tau and h of t prime minus tau looks like this. And the area which is what I'm computing with the integral, looks like this. Okay, so again, tau shows up because in order to do the convolution of x and h, we actually have to look at x for values, uh, at values other than t, and in, in general we have to look at x for every possible value of its argument. We have to look at h for every possible value of its argument. And that's what the tau does. It goes, it ranges from minus infinity to infinity, allowing us to look at x for every possible value of its argument, and h of t minus tau for every possible value of its argument. So hopefully this is cleared up, why on earth we have a tau there, and um, I hope this has been useful for you.